Good morning. Welcome to our worship. Would you like to be seated? Good to see you all here and know that you've all known to change your clocks this morning. And welcome to those that are joining us on Zoom, assuming that they've also changed their clocks. We're glad that we have this opportunity to worship together, that we have this place provided for us and the freedom in this land together. And we're thankful for those who've cared for this place over the generations and particularly for the Boonarong people. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And we acknowledge that our first people have never ceded sovereignty of the land and we seek a far better future for them. Let's hear some words from the Psalm. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Our trust is in God and God alone. We rejoice in God's love for us and for all people. Let's worship God who is our refuge and our strength. Let us pray. God of all time and space, we worship and adore you. You could have remained far beyond our understanding, but you chose to reveal yourself in the person of Jesus, your son, our saviour. We are thankful for the ways in which he widened the horizons of our minds and our hearts when he made your love and your wisdom known through his gentleness and compassion and humility, through his willingness to suffer and die for us. We thank you, O oh God, for the empowering work of your spirit that you give to us so that we can live with the mind of Christ giving shape to how we live, to our words and our actions, helping us also to be gentle and compassionate and humble and willing to suffer for your sake. We offer you, O oh God, our thanks and our praise in response to all the great gifts that you have given to us and especially to the, for the gift of Jesus Christ. Merciful God, we come before you not trusting in our own goodness, but in your abundant mercy. You call us and reveal yourself to us, and yet often we recreate you in our image rather than recognising your unique nature, your transcendent purity, your almighty power, your heart of holiness and the brilliance of your glory. We're not worthy to come into your presence, O oh God, and yet your grace extends to us and urges us to come and to respond to you. Forgive us, O oh God, for all the ways in which we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, for those things we have done that we shouldn't have done and for those things we've left undone that we should have done. Cleanse, renew and transform us by your, by your life-giving spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. We rejoice with the words of the prophet Isaiah. I have swept away your offences like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And we are thankful to God for God's grace and forgiveness. And in thankfulness and praise of God, let's sing together at the name of Jesus.
we come to our time of hearing our Bible reading and Richard's going to bring that to us today. Thanks. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. It will be in two sections, the first from verses 23 to 27, and then from 28 to 32. First is the question about Jesus' authority. Jesus came back to the temple, and as he taught, the chief priests and elders came to him and asked, what right do you have to do these things? Who gave you such right? Jesus answered them, I will ask you just one question, and if you give me an answer, I will tell you the right I have to do these things. Where did John's right to baptise come from? Was it from God or was it from man? They started to argue among themselves, what shall we say? If we answer from God, he will say to us, why then did you not believe John? But if we say from man, we are afraid of what the prophet might do, because they are all convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you then by what right I do these things. The second reading from verses 28 to 32 is the parable of the two sons. Now what do you think? There was once a man who had two sons. He went to the elder one and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. I don't want to, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. Yes, sir, he answered, but he did not go. Which one of the two did his father did what his father wanted? The older one, they answered. So Jesus said to them, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John the Baptist came to you, showing you the right path to take, and you would not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw this, you did not later change your minds and believe him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we give thanks. During the course of the week, I was talking with a, a young person and a typical question was raised with them, which I guess we've all probably had to answer at different points in our lives when we were younger. I certainly remember being asked it. So the question was what they wanted to be when they became older. I recall an aunt of mine who used to line us all up and quiz us about this every time she saw us. This young person's response surprised me, but it was extremely honest when they said, I want to be important. <laughs> and we sort of can get surprised by an answer by, like that, but really we all want to be valued and we all want to be respected and we all want to do things that are significant. And Jesus, in his brief life here on earth, did those sorts of things. He did significant things. And so he was gaining quite a following in the community around him. And to some of the religious leaders of the time, this was viewed with suspicion. Maybe they thought he was going to take away from their authority or diminish their influence. Jesus is seen as an impressive figure by many people and by people outside the Christian faith. People of other faiths and people of no faith at all will often say what an impressive figure Jesus was. This passage though revolves around Jesus' authority. 
and where it comes from and the characteristics of his authority. All who are confronted by Jesus really have to answer that question about where does his authority come from? Is it from God or is it just something he's brought up himself? Is it of human origin? Jesus makes some amazing claims. In scripture, we have an incredible variety of them and I thought we should explore or just be confronted by a few of them today because sometimes they're spread throughout scripture and we don't hear all these claims he made. He said, the Father and I are one. I am the resurrection and the life. In his encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well, we hear that the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. In speaking to Thomas, Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in speaking to his disciples, he said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does this work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you don't, then believe me because of the works themselves, the works that Jesus did. And again, he said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood haven't revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And in John's gospel, the author says, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who believe are condemned already because they haven't believed in the only son of God. And finally, if we go right back to the early stage and think about what Mary was told when she learned what was to happen to her, the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. So we're confronted with some amazing claims that Jesus makes and we're confronted with what we do with those claims that he makes. How credible is this Jesus? Why should we believe in him? Why is his message so important? C.S. Lewis, in speaking about who Jesus was, had a famous quote that you may well have heard before, and sometimes just part of the quote is used, but I thought you might, be value, might value hearing the whole thing today. Lewis said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from the, saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, as in Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. When we look at that in the light of those passages, we can see what Lewis is saying. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who merely, who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who thinks he's a poached egg, or he'd be a devil of hell. You must make your own choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He hasn't left us that open to us. He never intended to. And so our passage today confronts us with the package of who is Jesus? What do we think about him? He demonstrates a, an indisputable authority during his ministry, something that grabbed the attention of religious leaders. He demonstrated the authority to heal, even from a distance, to teach and to forgive sins, an authority to impart authority to his followers. 
And Jesus declares at the end of the gospel that he actually has all authority. He taught with an authority that the crowds recognized as real and they actually compared it with the scribes and religious leaders, with his opponents and said, they don't teach with God-given authority. They advocate out of human tradition. The religious leaders had come to some judgments regarding John and Jesus. And they weren't seeking information when they asked Jesus by what authority he did the things he did. Rather, they were trying to trap him in his own words. They didn't want to provoke criticism from the crowd, so they tread carefully. They'd been following Jesus and Jesus knew them. He knew where they were coming from and he could see what they were doing. It seems like in the earlier days, Jewish leaders may well have been open to Jesus and his teaching, but certainly by now they've changed their minds and there's strong opposition to him. And so Jesus uses that parable that we heard, a parable we only read in Matthew's gospel. Like the brothers in the parable, now the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to be the ones who respond positively to Jesus. And these tax collectors and prostitutes were those most despised in the community. Can you imagine how infuriating that must have been to them to be told that these people ahead of them were going into the kingdom of God, ahead of these religious leaders? Jesus' question to them not only relates to how they treated him and how they treated John, but it relates to the authority John had and the authority Jesus had. And of course, if they accepted John's authority, surely they should also accept Jesus' authority. And if they didn't accept it, they probably wouldn't accept him either. But as religious leaders, they were claiming to be faithfully obedient to God, yet they seem to have this blind spot there to the fact that authentic obedience often involves responding in faith to something new that God's doing. Douglas Hare has stated how easily church work can degenerate into little more than simply maintaining an institution with no excitement concerning God's active grace, no awareness of what God is doing and consequently no enthusiasm for evangelism and renewal. So as we enter into this new week, it may be good to examine ourselves and to be open to God examining us and to revealing to us how it is that we respond day by day to the authority of Jesus in our lives. How often is it that we consider how Jesus would respond if he was in the same circumstances we are facing? How ready are we to live under the authority of Jesus? to practically allow Jesus to be Lord of our lives. It's important that we're open to Jesus confronting us and particularly at any point where we've made a positive response to God and then for some reason or another backed away from it and gone in a different direction. We're thankful to God for God's goodness and grace and mercy towards us and that as we come to him and as we remember his love and grace, so we can know of his acceptance of us as we are and his desire to transform and liberate us. And so we come later to celebrate communion and to remember God's good grace to us. Amen. We're going to sing together a hymn that's focused on how we respond to God's authority to us. Forth in your name, O Lord, I go.
We come now to a time of sharing notices and other um, news in the life of our church community. I know David has something to share with us. As far as I know, that's all I have notices. Ah, Alison Munch. Is that the. No. Was it the Munch announcement I just saw? Oh, and the sausage sizzle, yes, and there's a sign-up sheet, isn't there, for a sausage sizzle? Mm. Do you want to come talk about it? Alison first, yeah, I've got a whole, I've got a whole bag of beans. Okay, as Joy uh, mentioned, we're having the munch today, lunch and munch today after church, if anyone wishes to attend. And also uh, on voting day, which I think is the 14th, um, there's a sausage chisel we're having um, to raise money for the church. Um, and if anybody would like to help us out just for an hour, during the day it's from eight till four um, it's usually a really good fundraiser and we'd accept any help we can thank you good morning i uh you all right dan okay now, speaking of lists, I've got a list here of people who've said they intend to come to the uh, garden party next Sunday afternoon at Lynn Knight's place in Dunn Road. If you're not on the list, you can still come. I think uh, Ray will let you in. Actually, it's Andrew at the front entrance who's taking your $10. But please let me know because it gives us some idea how many scones and cream to prepare. Now, look, the other important things to talk about, firstly, I don't know if you realise there was a grand final yesterday and uh, Brisbane didn't win. I'm, I'm noticing with interest that uh, Chris Gall hasn't turned up this morning. I I'm not quite sure whether he's been revelling, but Sue might be able to tell us a bit more about that. Um, there are other events today that are perhaps even more important than the grand final. Firstly, Andrew has turned 95 today. Take a bow. <laughs> it's become a kind of a national treasure. Five to go. <laughs> um, there are other important birthdays today. Um, I've got a grandson. <laughs> His name's Dougie, and none of you will know him, but he's... Richard's son, he's turning 16 yesterday and we're having a party for him in the park up at Camberwell today. I only mention that because I'd like to be able to tell, tell him that we mentioned him in church this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one actually is Peter Rawlings turned 60 today. Now that may not mean much to you, but he used to be treasurer here in the time when Andrew was minister here and uh, he's having his 60th birthday. Um, sickies abound, of course. Um, Richard all had to leave after reading this morning because Eleanor's, again, very unstable. Um, but on the good side is John Matthews has returned indomitable uh, after a few weeks off. Uh, good on you, John. But his wife is still pretty crook, so... Go and say something nice to, to uh, John Matthews afterwards. Um, I, that's all on my list. Will I proceed with prayers? I, uh, Maxine asked me to follow today with the prayer that I'd actually prepared for last week. Do you remember we did a, a, a video and we were talking about the... the the wider church, the uniting world in the Pacific Islands and their tradition and background. And uh, I thought it's worth occasionally just reflecting on our roots, that from which we have come. We are a lot bigger in our tradition and our history than the people we will meet at church this morning. So if I can find my glasses, we'll... Uh, 
can't find it. Yes, I can. A prayer for the people. Dear God and Father of all mankind, and in a special sense, Father of us who believe in you personally, thank you for a faith that has embraced the language and culture of so many people and countries. Thank you for the history of the church, born in the cauldron of Roman persecution and opposition, for those who met faithfully underground in Rome, before dawn and the day's work, who left their creed on the gloomy walls of the catacombs, simply that Jesus Christ, Saviour, is Lord. The fish symbol that has carried us through history. We thank you for the Council of Churches in Nicaea and for all the holy scriptures that were canonised in the fourth century and became our Bible and have nourished and informed and inspired your church ever since. And for the translators like Wycliffe and John Hunt that have put the good news of Jesus and his death and resurrection into concepts that have meaning to millions of people in the Pacific Islands today. Especially today, we thank you for those who have suffered physically and mentally for their faith and yet remained faithful. We suffer no fear or danger to come to worship this morning. It was easy to walk in. But we thank you for those unknown faithful warriors over the centuries who have suffered persecution, cruelty, harassment, burning and death for their faith, for simply owning and naming the name of Jesus. We thank you for the work of Barnabas Aid and Open Doors who organise awareness and information and response to such persecution in Nigeria, Somalia, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Kyrgyzstan, China, North Korea, Ethiopia and North Sudan. Lord, we are so blessed and privileged in our freedom to worship. We thank you today for the long tradition of the Uniting in Church and its preceding Presbyterian and, Be and Methodist arms in bringing the good news of Jesus to the Pacific Islands and to the countries like Tonga, Samoa, Vanuatu and Fiji we heard of last Sunday. Thank you for the fundamental simplicity of the faith of these Christian communities and the wonder and inspiration of their tuneful singing of hymns. We thank you and bless you for the work of Red Cross for United Nations, Red Crescent and the Uniting World, another church agency in bringing relief Bring, forgive us for our compassion fatigue and help us to respond to our community's needs of food, clothes and housing and care where we can contribute. And thank you, Lord, that we thank you that you love all our broken humanity, no matter how much we ignore your rules to live by. Forgive us for our sins, personal and corporate because of your unrestrained love and care as shown in Jesus. Wake, wake us, make us better servants of yours, willing to work for each other's benefit and to wash each other's feet, to ring each other up, drop in when people are sick or wounded and willing to simply walk where others, with others in friendship praying for their restoration in your kingdom's harmony. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We come now to um, recognise and to give thanks to God for the ways in which we have been blessed and to bring to God those offerings that have been brought into the life of the congregation, some in physical form today that it will bring down and others that have been given electronically. And at this time, we also acknowledge the gift of life itself and, and our willingness to give ourselves to God to be used by God. Let's stand as we do this. as a sign of our commitment to God. Holy God, you are the source of all that is good. We thank you for the rich blessings of life. And in thankfulness, we bring ourselves and all that we have, that we may be used according to your choosing, that our gifts, that all that we have may be used by you in the ways you choose. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we stand, let's join together in our communion hymn today, Lord Jesus, joy of loving hearts.
peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you like to take a brief moment just to turn to a couple of people and offer the peace of God to them, recognising that some prefer to have a bit of distance still in these days where we continue to grapple with COVID. be with you. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like to start making your way back to your seat. Always harder to get us to, to sit back down, isn't it, than to, to go. As you do so, we want to affirm our welcome to those who are worshipping with us online as well, and in, you're welcome to join in this, with us in this time of celebrating communion with elements you may have at home there. This is an open table and all are welcome to share in it. We come to this table to remember that Jesus died for us, that he rose again, that we may have new life. We come to remember the depths of Jesus' love for us in being willing to suffer and die, that we may know God and that we may share life with God now and into eternity. When in 1 John 4 we read, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And in John's gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world may be saved. So Paul wrote in his account of what we believe happened around the time of that last supper that Jesus celebrated with his friends. Among friends gathered round a table, Jesus took bread and having blessed it, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. In the same way, he took the wine, and having given thanks for it, he poured it out and gave the cup to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new relationship with God, sealed with my blood. Take this and share it. I shall drink wine with you next in the coming kingdom of God. So now, following Jesus' example, we take these ordinary things of the world through which God can bless us. And as Jesus offered thanks for the gifts of the earth, let us celebrate God's goodness together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give thanks that tra God travels with us and nourishes us along the way of life. Living God, we give thanks to you for in your mercy you chose to breathe life into your people, into plants and animals, creatures great and small. When people needed assurance about the future, you promised Abraham descendants more numerous than the stars of the sky. And when your people found themselves enslaved, you rose up leaders like Moses and Miriam and Aaron, who led your people to freedom. They remembered your goodness with their mouths, but failed to reflect your goodness with their lives. And so you spoke through prophets. And when their words went unheeded, you spoke a new word, which would be an eternal reminder of your love and your mercy. Through your love for the world, the word became flesh and lived amongst us. And as if, if that wasn't enough, he gave his life for us. We offer you praise, gracious God, for in the communion of your love, Christ comes close to us and we come close to Christ. Therefore, with all our brothers and sisters, we praise you from our hearts for your unending blessing in the eternal hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, do in this place what you did in an upstairs room. Breathe your spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine, that they may be heaven's food and drink for us, renewing, sustaining and making us whole, and that we may be your body on earth, loving and caring in this world. We bless your name, O God. We give thanks to you for all your great goodness to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We won't use the Lord's Prayer because we have used that already in the course of our worship. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Together with the elements that people share at home, we use them to celebrate God's great goodness to us. The Agnes Day. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Let us come and receive this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Jesus Christ and feed on him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. We'll come as we usually do using the central aisle and some will come and, and share the bread with you here and then you can go to the side for the grape juice. And there's a basket to the side there in which you can put your glasses when you're done. Thank you. Body of Christ broken for you, Nada. Body of Christ broken for you, Nancy. Body of Christ broken for you, Nancy. Body of Christ broken for you, Annabelle.
people have been served that won't wish to. All right. Let's come to our prayer after communion. This prayer dates back to the 5th century and it's good that we can continue to join in it and see it as very relevant to our lives in this time as well. Grant, O Lord Jesus, that the ears that have heard the voice of your songs may be closed to the voice of dispute, that the eyes that have seen your great love may also behold your blessed hope, that the tongues that have sung your praise may speak the truth in love, that the feet which have walked in your courts may walk in the region of light, and that the bodies that have received your living body may be restored in newness of life. Glory to you for your inexpressible gift. Amen. We're going to sing together a hymn, Lord of the Church. We pray for our renewing, possibly words that are new to us, but a tune that is quite familiar to us. So as we go into this of God inspire us. May the love of the Lord Jesus Christ motivate us and may the enabling power of the Holy Spirit equip us 
to serve God and to serve the whole of God's creation. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen. Amen.